We're excited to have you join us for our first Teaching Against the Rager virtual talk for the fall 2023 season. Um, we do have more coming up, so please stay tuned. Follow us on all the things in all the places uh, and join us if you can, if you're inclined on October 28th for an in-person teaching workshop series. Um, we're just really excited about this really timely and important conversation. We're excited about our two scholars. Uh, and we want to say a special thank you to the Teaching Against Erasure co-sponsors and collaborators in the Center for Politics and Race in America, the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice, the Queer Newark Oral History Project, the Clement Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience, the Disability Studies Program, and the Departments of Urban Education, History, and Africana Studies. Um, in this conversation I have with me tonight, two brilliant scholars. I may have said brilliant a million times. You will absolutely see why momentarily. Uh, Christopher uh, Etienne and Christopher Talib Cherie. Um, Talib Cherie is an NJ Step alumnus who serves as the senior program coordinator for the New Jersey Scholarship and Transformative Education in Prisons Initiative, also called NJ Step. He is also a co-instructor within the Department of Urban Education here at Rutgers University, Newark. Um, and his experience with the criminal justice system has deeply influenced his work, which is informed by the principles of abolitionist teaching and restorative justice. Christopher Etienne is a multimedia strategist with a background in creative writing, journalism, and video production. Educated as a documentary filmmaker and an Africana studies historian, he seeks to use his accolades to spotlight injustice and raise awareness about social issues. Currently, he works as the STEM program coordinator for the Prison Teaching Initiative at Princeton University. He creates curricula for incarcerated college students seeking opportunities in STEM, leads instructional workshops for educators and postdoctorate students, and furnishes support for summer interns participating in advanced research projects. Uh, and his vision for a just future is premised on using education as a tool to enlighten the uninformed, extend educational opportunities to the justice impacted, and liberate minoritized communities from the chains of oppression. These brothers are dope, y'all. Um, all right, so tonight's talk is about thinking through classroom practices that mirror larger political frameworks and policies across our nation. And I know we may be a little bit uh, politically fatigued in the moment, um, but we are living through a time in which our politics seem to saturate school curriculum, instructional choices, disciplinary practices, and absolutely uh, the availability of school resources and support for youth and families. Hence, understanding the inequalities faced in our local communities is closely linked to the everyday practices unfolding in our schools. So we want to start our conversation by uh, taking a look at a short clip shared by Vox News earlier this year. Um, and then we're going to move from there. So let's see if we can get that rolling. Take a look at these four kids. These preschool teachers watched a video of them playing for a 2016 study. The study asked them to press the enter key every time they saw a behavior that could become a potential challenge. But the thing about the study is it's kind of deceptive. There's actually no misbehavior in the video. The kids are actors and the researchers were using eye tracking software because what they really wanted to know was when teachers expect misbehavior, who are they watching? The study found that both white and black teachers spent more time gazing at black boys than other children. Black boys make up less than a quarter of the nation's preschoolers, but more than 40% of preschool suspensions. The study's lead researcher told the Washington Post that implicit biases don't begin with black men and police. They begin with black preschoolers and their teachers, if not earlier. Okay, um, so we want to start our conversation there. Hopefully everybody was able to um, see that and hear it clearly. Um, a lot of what we see sort of in that video is linked to a broader phrase um, that some of us may have heard of called the school to prison pipeline. Um, and this language is usually connected to school disciplinary practices and instruction and support. Uh, can you both talk a little bit about what this pipeline actually is and why it's important to understand? I guess I'll start off. Um, 
And what I wanted to just state is that the school to prison pipeline isn't like just some abstract idea about how someone who, you know, goes to an at risk school could eventually end up in prison. It focuses specifically on punitive disciplinary practices and how these approaches are funneling our youth into the prison system. But I would argue one of our biggest mistakes is isolating this pipeline. Um, so like, let's go through some, let's go through an example. Imagine if we provide a school with all the resources it needs for the students to pass their classes, but the community that the school is stationed in is still being over police. The people are dealing with high rates of home and food insecurities, poor air and water quality, and lackluster mental health resources. Can we expect everyone to get on track just by fixing that one school? Well, like the school to prison pipeline is actually a product of these social issues. And it's also exasperated by discriminatory legislation that targets our communities. When we look at the school to prison pipeline, we see remnants of like these discriminatory policies, like zero tolerance policies, the street, the three strikes law and stop and frisk. All of these are present in our educational institutions stationed in our low income communities. And one of the most inequitable practices is how our schools are funded. We know that property taxes fund public schools. So if you live in a low income community, the money the public school receives from local property taxes usually isn't enough to support that institution. With that said, we could effectively argue that the school to prison pipeline is actually an extension of the poverty to prison pipeline and the urban housing to prison pipeline and also the mental health to prison pipeline. And until we start seeking out ways to like remedy these social issues, we will be dooming our youth and our low income citizens to the path of prison. Noted. I defer to the brothers opening because we had a discussion about this several times now. And he's someone who, as he has articulated just now, brought that to my attention. It's we get caught up in the headlines. It's really easy to put school to prison pipeline and then everyone, particularly in academia, attaches themselves to that, theorize around it and then start to expound upon that headline, missing with the brother's point he just made just now. But when we go back inside of the classroom, though, and the imagery was important of children, right? Black and brown bodies have historically been surveilled in this nation. This is facts. We know this. Our children are the very first ones to be surveilled. And their behaviors, while we know through developmental psychology, teaches us that the prefrontal cortex is not even in a developmental stage for them to behave how we adults believe they should behave in. We then utilize these surveilling tactics on children by saying, sit in your chair, don't move. Why did you do that? Et cetera. And then offering as a solution to these misconceptions or forgetfulness of when, what it is like to be a child by detaining said child, go sit in the corner. It's time out. You can't play with your friends. And then graduating through those stages to the point where you could potentially be suspended from the entire environment. So now you're an outcast or then ultimately being expelled. So we utilize those exact carceral logics at the very early stages of development for black and brown bodies, children, all the way up through their entire academic career. And that is that in and of itself is the reciprocal nature that can be found in the school to prison pipeline. It's the carceral logic that exists in prisons because even inside prisons, there is detaining, there is suspending and expelling. So you you already kind of answered a little bit of the second question um, that I was going to jump into, uh, but that puts us in a good place because I was going to say a part of what we see and maybe even what these preschool teachers might have perceived and how they 
were contributing to this project um, is this sense that, you know, teachers are um, objective, right? That they are, they have no malignant intention, that schools are not um, intentionally maligning children, that they're doing what is in their best interest. Um, and I was going to ask, you know, can you talk about a few more of uh, the practices that we see in classrooms and in schools, which do in fact contribute to a pipeline um, that reflects some of these other things. I know you talked about uh, rates of expulsion um, and disciplinary things. Are there other things that um, we should or need to be mindful of um, that's happening in our classrooms and in our schools? Yeah, um, I did want to focus a little bit more um, as well on like these exclusionary practices mm -hmm. because I feel like they're at like the center of a lot of these um, issues that are negatively impacting our students and um, and I had a couple I jotted down um, one of them was a lack of relationship building um, another one was outsourcing disciplinary practices. And of course, as um, Talib stated, adopting exclusionary practices in classrooms. So when it comes to relationship building, let's speak briefly about the importance of cultural competency. So we know that 70% of school teachers who work in urban communities are white. And we also know that although Black students account for 13% of student populations nationwide, they represent over 30% of students who are suspended from school. The majority of these suspensions are for disorderly conduct, which is often left to the interpretation of the teacher. So, and this is where like cultural competency comes into play. Because if, when you start looking into this information, you're seeing all oh, these students are being suspended at an alarming rate, um, rate for altering their uniforms. Like I know, like, like I remember they try to make us wear uniforms when I was young. I'm like, all right, I'm about to make this fly. You know, <laughs> like I'm gonna make sure this looks good on me. I want some aspect of individuality when it comes to this uniform. Another major thing that we've seen was um, when it came to disorderly conduct, and um, this specifically targeted um, young Black um, women, was um, one, um, they felt that um, these students, when these students raised their voice, and when these students spoke with their hands, that these were threatening gestures. Mm -hmm. So students are literally being thrown out of classrooms for expressing passion and utilizing cultural cues. And this is why I say like cultural competency is so significant because if you understood the neighborhood that the student was reared in, if you understood how, you know, us as, as storytellers, you know, we may, you know, try to get a little bit more visual with gestures and with utilizing our hands or when we get excited, you know, like we might speak a little bit louder in a more um, boisterous manner, then you wouldn't be removing the student who's obviously engaging with their education from your classroom. And... And I think that's one of the major issues because rather than building relationships with our students and learning to speak with them in their language, we adopt exclusionary disciplinary practices. And studies show that suspended students are more likely to disengage and drop out of school. Yet this is our like go-to tactics. We have officers es escort our students out of class like, they're hardened criminals, but we expect our students to trust us. And I think disciplining and I think disciplining students by removing them from a learning environment, like it doesn't just simply remove that student from being able to like stay on track with the other students in the classroom, but it also creates animosity between that student and their learning institution. So like now you start seeing students adopt this level of anti-intellectualism because they feel 
that the class is against them, their teachers is against them, and the educational institution itself is against them. They're rebelling because they feel oppressed. And we understand that this type of discipline conjures up those feelings, but we still aren't willing to take that step and seek out more holistic approaches in when we interact with our students. That's good. Taylor, but I don't know if you wanted to jump in um, and add anything. No, he succinctly pointed to the problems that we know, right? And the things that our children are still facing. Um, if there's one thing I could add to that, that is probably confounding all of this is teacher parent relationships. Um, yet again, this goes back to the social stressors that are there, right? The inequities that are involved there. A parent may not be able to attend a parent teacher associated meeting because they're working to provide for their family to the best of their ability. Unfortunately, what we find as a consequence of that is that the regulations or even policies that come into place to continue to surveil our children are coming from the mindset of people who are privileged to do so. Mm -hmm. And they are the very people who hold implicitly beliefs or even explicit beliefs that black and brown bodies need to be regulated and surveilled so that their privileged child could continue to excel. That in and of itself becomes one of the most exclusionary tactics in and of itself because it's very passive. But as a consequence, our children are being deprived. And just to highlight the point, I myself found myself with an opportunity to participate in a parent-teacher conference recently at the start of the semester. And I'm happy to go there to support my bonus son. And one of the first questions I asked is, what books will he be reading? They couldn't provide an answer. And I articulated, this is a problem. But then I observed the room around me. And this is a school of over 400 students, and there was maybe 20 parents present. So those are the type of systems that are in place right now. So if there's anything I would say that also adds to these tactics is exactly that, is the fact that unfortunately, a lot of our parents are unable to participate in the education of their children. I want to kind of lean in there because I think you both said some important things. I, I love the point about relationship building and making sure that schools don't just have relationships with the students or the learners, but that they have relationships with the community, the parents. Um, but I also like this point that you just made, Talib, about what is essentially curriculum, right? Like what types of books is my child reading? Um, can you both say a little bit more more about that? Um, you know, how much of a role does curriculum play in helping to sort of undermine this parallel series of, of pipelines that are, you know, connected to these other bigger political things? You want to start off, um, Talib? Yeah, sure. So my bonus son, I call him my bonus son because he is not a step. There's nothing secondary to him, right? He's an addition to my life and I love him like my own. We, me and my wife are very intentional in providing him with a curriculum at home that's Afrocentric. We support him in a community that's Afrocentric. School districts have to strongly consider creating school curriculum that is culturally promotive of the students in their classroom. While it is the case, as I've alluded to, that parents are not there, we do know that administrators have numbers in front of them with regards to the demographics of their school. It is not enough to continue to say, oh, it was the district that essentially tells us how it is we're supposed to instruct. No, you're on the ground. You're an educator. You know who you're teaching. You choose the curriculum and you put it up the ladder for approval. Right. So if anything, there needs to be culturally promotive um, curriculum in place. I don't want my child to be reading about a benevolent society that saved his people from darkness or savagery. 
right? I want him to hear about the first institutions of learning that we know was in the African nations. You're muted, Chris. <laughs> Oh no, no, I just I just was shouting out the University of Mali. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, yeah. Like um Masa Musa had his um fingerprint all over that. Phenomenal. Um and I guess when it comes to education, like I still kind of go off like the philosophies that like our dominant culture doesn't really um, like practice in in these schools currently, and um, we said this um, a couple of times, you know. But our schools are usually siloed, right? Um, Talib stated this, um, and um, and yeah, like and through research, you know, we know that this is true. Our schools are usually cut off if from the community, but we grew up in like a different approach towards education. It was like, it takes a village, you know, um, each one teach one. That means that education itself wasn't restricted to one area. Education was a communal effort. And I believe like that's how, um, that's the model that we should adopt, especially in our minoritized communities. Like education should be a community effort. It were just as Talib stated, what are you teaching my kid? What books are they reading? Because we know that um, a couple years back in 2015, we seen Pearson and um, McGraw books actually state that um, in the 1700s, um, millions of um, African migrants came to America seeking employment opportunities. I don't want my kids like, like I want to see if that's the history you're teaching our youth, and the community should see that. And if the community isn't good with it, then then we had to move out this book. You know, like how many books do you have our kids reading that were penned by black authors? And there is no discipline you could talk about in existence that didn't have like some black professional scholars moving that discipline forward. So you had to be able, I want to see Black authors in this classroom. I want to see my kids represented in this classroom. And I want our um, youth to gain a better understanding of the neighborhood around them and the society they live in through this classroom. You know, let's speak about how residential segregation impacted our neighborhoods. Let's speak about the uprisings in the 70s and how that like just changed the dynamics of things. You know, let's speak about legislation that was passed post civil rights and how that impacts you to this day. Like that's what education is supposed to be, a community effort and where we learn together, we grow together and we combine our efforts to improve um, uh, um, to improve upon the quality of life in this community. I think that's, that's so good. Um, and I, I want to kind of pivot just a little bit because I think what you're both pointing to is um, a need to kind of fill in some of these inequities with a richer, more broad curricular focus. Um, but we know that there are folks in all over this country, right? There are there are states that have lobbied and continue to lobby for the removal of of exactly what you're describing. Um, and I think, or at least in my relationships with teachers and school districts, a part of what folks will say is, you know, we really don't want to touch this. Um, you know, this is a this is as traumatic for these babies as it is for me to stand up here as you you just noted, right? Like a white person, a white woman um, trying to talk to black children, white children, Asian children, uh, multi-ethnic children, multilingual children, um, indigenous children uh, about things that I'm not sure how to navigate. Um, and so I, I, I think that that's really it's really connected to the work that you both do in terms of trauma-informed practice. And so I wondered if you could um, talk to us about what that is and maybe walk us through how some of that can help 
um, address the traumas created by not discussing these historical things, right, or these sociopolitical things, and also the traumas created when we try to discuss them um, and do that inadequately. Okay. Yeah. So at the NJ step, what I my work here as a senior program coordinator is twofold. A, it's therapeutic for me. It's therapeutic for me. And so I am a system impacted child. Um, I grew up literally in prison. I entered into that space at the age of 15 years old. I did not return into society until I was 41 years old. Education for me in the early stages was autodidactic, far before I even knew what that word was. <laughs> right. And then I was introduced into this world as education being a vehicle for emancipation. And now being in a trauma-informed environment, the way I approach things is saying, I don't have to have the answers. That's the very first thing. Nor should I look at any of the students that I encounter as having some type of disability, right? Or coming from the perspective of thinking that I am going to rescue them. It's not the role of, of trauma-informed. Trauma-informed is to be able to at least listen to what it is that that student needs in that moment. And being culturally competent enough to be able to get that person to reclaim their personal autonomy, right? Um, and there's many other venues where you find individuals talking about safety, uh, maybe even peer support and all that. All of those things are a collaborative model of that. But what I have found, the best trauma-informed approach to education is being able to interpret through cultural competency what is needed in that moment for that person to get a little bit closer to who they are saying that they want to be, not who I deem that they need to become in order to see themselves. Well put, well put. Like I, uh, man, there's way too much people out here with a savior's complex. <laughs> you know, like this is it, you know, like, um, and I love using the analogy, like I've never been a savior. Um, I'm not trying to be a savior. I see us more as locksmiths, mm. you know, like, you know, I'm going to show you, um, you know, how to craft this key so you could emancipate yourself. Like, I'm not I'm not the one breaking your chains for you. But when it comes to trauma, trauma informed, you kind of put, <laughs> you know, like you kind of stole a lot of my thunder. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I kind of think back to when I first started um, teaching in prison, I've been, you know, just given the, the, the blessing and the honor to be able to go inside and sit down with our currently incarcerated scholars. Some of the most brilliant people you'll see in a classroom is an individual that's currently incarcerated. Like, and looking at this, looking at education as their opportunity to escape from that environment and their opportunity to reshape their future when they transition out. And um, one of the things I remember that I encountered was um, a lot of my students would sit with their back against the wall, right? So they would um, pull their desk back, you know, like, and they'll have their back against the wall. And usually, like, they would have to have the door in their view, you know? And if somebody walked behind them or, like, they had to see, you know, what was going on. So I recall when I was younger, and we used to kind of do the same thing, you know, we'd get in trouble. You can't move the desk in the classroom. You know, like you're being disruptive. If I catch you moving the desk again, I'm sending you out. You're going to the principal's office. And I never understood why the instructor didn't just ask us a question. But now I'm looking at, you know, my um, brothers who are um, incarcerated doing the same thing. And I understand it because I know that the type of environment 
a lot of these individuals have to go back to. It requires them. It requires them to be just knowledgeable on, you know, who's walking around them. Because some of these environments are hostile environments. Now, if I tell that student, no, you have to move that chair in the middle of the room. And if you don't, I'm sending you out. That student does listen to me and move his chair in the middle of the room. A student is not going to be engaged throughout the whole class day because they're going to constantly look over their shoulder. Every noise, every click they hear, every creak they hear, they're going to be paranoid because they don't feel safe with their back open. And that's like my metaphor to what trauma informed like really means. It's being aware of how like past trauma may impact a student's interaction in the classroom and ensuring that they feel comfortable in that in the in that environment. That's the cornerstone of trauma informed teaching practices. But I think one of the best things about trauma informed practices is that it goes against the cookie cutter approach that we adopted in our public school systems. Rather, trauma-informed practices place a student at the center of their instruction. This increases their under, um, and this helps us increase their ability to engage in their environment. And doing so grants the students autonomy over their education. It also encourages instructors and challenges them to start individualizing and personalizing lesson planning and curriculum for their students. Because if I understand that my student is a, a visual learner, if I understand that my student um, is hearing impaired, you know, like if I understand that my student is differently able, I'm going to be able to like reshape the curriculum I'm introducing the student to because I know how the student is able to engage and I know what causes the student to disengage. Just like I know if I have the students sit in the middle of the classroom without their back against the wall, that's going to cause them to disengage. Or I may know from certain aspects of body language when a student feels uncomfortable so I'm not going to call on them and tell them to read in front of the classroom. Like trauma-informed teaching is, li is literally all about empathy, how to be empathetic to a student's ability to learn and engage in a classroom and how to adopt curriculum and create curriculum that ensure that that student is able to reach their educational peak. We have um, just two more questions. I want to make space for people who may also have some questions. Um, actually, we have one, and then now I have a burning question. Uh, so I'm going to ask that for the first, if that's all right with y'all watching. And it's just going to have to be all right with y'all who watch the recording afterwards. Sorry, um, but not sorry. Uh, so the, my question is, if you're... If, if you are a teacher, an organizer, or somebody who's walking into a space that just does not have the ability to perceive some of those things. And I'll, I will offer sort of a side example, um, though I won't, I won't mention the school. Um, my pre-service and early active teaching was in a school where like nearly a hundred percent of the students were coming from severely underserved communities. Um, now I come from an underserved community and so I had some sense of some things to recognize, but it was not in the state that at the time I was working in. I'm, I'm not from that state. So if you're an instructor or somebody who is dedicated to the work, but you come into a space where you don't have all of the skills that you need to recognize how to maybe be empathetic um, in the way that you need to reach your students or your your community, that new community, what is the starting point? Like, what's the first thing um, that you as that organizer or educator need to do in order to start learning with um, your learners, whoever they might be? There's, there's a really interesting thing that happened on the inside. So one of the pedagogical approaches we utilize inside is that you assess 
but from the students themselves with regards to the guidelines of the classroom. It immediately disrupts the hierarchy system. You it, you come into that space and maybe even consider having, in Arabic, we call it a khalqa, or in its translates to mean a circle, a circle of knowledge, that sense of community that's happening there, as opposed to the hierarchical approach of sitting in rows. But then asking that very important question of how are you today? It doesn't get into you. You can't get into starting to educate until you actually come in as a human being and have an interaction on that level. Uh, it will disarm people. The other thing I would take into consider the word that you said, those who are dedicated to educating. Right. We recognize that teachers are underpaid, overworked, stressed out. But there are a lot of dedicated educators out here that have a passion for teaching K through 12. The trauma-informed approach as well, there's one thing I could also rec uh, 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 recommend in that is that see them not as your children, because some people don't treat their children well. See them more so as a trust that you have with someone that's about to take that next step in life as a human being. Right. And those those are very important components that need to happen because it's not a transactional interaction into those spaces. It's an educational space. And you have to take the holistic approach in there. There are children. Like I lastly, I'll just touch on this last point that I'm hoping would paint a picture. Right now, there's a child sitting in a detention center. Right? Detached from society. But at one point in time, there was an educator that cared enough about that student, but didn't know what to do or didn't even know how to ask the right questions. Although they saw that child every day disheveled. They saw that child every day with their head down on the table. They saw that child every day arguing with his or her classmates. And now they're in a detention center. They could have just asked, how are you doing? Thank you, Tala. Um, that's that's like just well said, and it's um yeah, it's tough to you know follow Tala whatever he, <laughs> whatever he drops a spill, but um, I found that yeah, like just like the power of conversations, even though I know it sounds super basic, the power of conversations, it does a lot to ensure that trust exists in a learning environment. And so one of the things that um, we started doing is um, like educational covenants. So we'll sit down with our students, you know, what do you expect to get out of this class? What are you looking to learn? And off of those conversations, you know, like we will go back to the lesson plan, you know, we can't build it off from scratch, but then we could insert certain things that these students suggested and make it more relevant to them and more applicable to their everyday life. And I've also found like when students see themselves in the curriculum, like they're more likely to engage. And so in our classrooms, you know, um, in our classrooms and prisons, we'll we'll bring prisons into the classrooms at times, and speak about the prison industrial complex, and how that intersects with um, environmental justice. And I'll we'll speak about water rights, food in prison, and how that's impacting the local population. You know, we'll speak on African diaspora communities. We'll speak on current history, you know, like politics now, what's happening today, and what these what does these new bills mean, you know, for this person's future or their children's future. And I think that kind of demonstrates like the real life applications of education. It's not just something that's stored away in a book. 
it becomes like this practice that you utilize in your everyday life. And so we'll have, I had students who would sit down like, yeah, you know, you heard about these issues with strokes and, you know, like because of um too much blacktops and not enough trees being planted. Yeah. Like, you know, like this happened in my community. Did it, and I thought about the lesson that you taught us on. And so like you start seeing the students themselves, they're utilizing critical thinking. They're making their own comparisons. They're drawing their own conclusions. And I think that's what education is. And that's, when you start seeing somebody get excited about education because they realize this is a tool I could use to explain how the world is mo is moving around me. Side note, I'm going to see if they'll let me take y'all's class. Um, I don't know if they will let me, but I will try. Uh, I'll ask Christina about that, about that later. Um, I know I have to turn the flo floor over to folks who have questions. Please put your questions um, in the Q&A section. I'm just going to kind of open one, leave, I guess, with one more, um, which is... Maybe the, the the elephant question or elephant in the room question. Um, we are in a moment of extremely divisive um, politics. Uh, it's in our teachers' lounges. It is on the playground. Um, it's on the street when the parents are double parked waiting to pick up the babies. Um, it is everywhere. These sort of you know really contentious things. And I wonder if you all have any. Um, concluding thoughts on how we work across those boundaries like how how do we begin to work with I'll use generously the term hesitant um, folks or hesitant communities how how can we begin to work with them um, and to put in practice the the things that you have talked about with us this evening I know the sigh and the deep breath. I'm struggling with it too. That's why I'm asking y'all. You've been dropping jewels over here. So somebody has to have the answers. Do you have something positive to say? Like I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm. I'm all that positive regarding this. You know. It's interesting. <laughs> so secular society sometimes is it pushes back actually a lot sometimes when it comes to faith. But in Islam, we have a tradition that says, وَتَسِمُ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرْقُ Which translates, enjoying good and piety and working with each other um, and do not help one another in sin and transgression. And it gets very complicated with regards to sin and transgression, so let's remove it from this and just put the word injustice. Don't work with each other when it comes to injustice, but when it comes to actually implementing that which could benefit everyone, you got to find that way to have a coalition. If we can't do it for our children, we have a problem. And we know that. I am more willing to work with the hesitant one than the one who's adamantly opposed to working. Because they're a small number. They're a small number of people with regards to the ones who genuinely walk around here just angry at their image. Right. So the olive branch is to frame it as it's for our children benefit to have carceral logics abolished from our schools. And I don't want to hear the flowery language or the popular terms of, no, we don't do that. We have restorative justice principles in place now. But that restorative justice has a jury of its peers that meets out some type of punishment from the child. It's not restorative justice. That's the criminal justice system under a different name. So working with parents, first and foremost, those who are hesitant, getting them to collaborate and be more interested in education and going from there. But that is a mighty battle um, to fight. Preaching to the choir. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you to a certain extent. Like, I will 
do my best to inform individuals who are willing to listen and learn. Like I think as scholars, that's the goal. That's all of our goals. You know, um, I would do my best. And um, I, yeah, like I'll share resources, you know, um, if, if I'm not an expert in a specific aspect of it, I may direct them to one of my colleagues. But all this reaching across the aisle stuff, you know, like being the bigger person stuff, like it's, it's tiring. Like that's not something I'm, that, that's, that's not what I got into this for. You know, I wasn't here to make you feel, you know, at ease about you colonizing us. I, I'm not here to make my oppressors feel feel better about their misdeeds. Like this isn't this isn't what I'm here for. This is this is not this is not my purpose. Like if if that's the side of the aisle you want to be on, then like I don't I'm not wasting my energy to try to convert you. I'm not converting people. You know, like what I'm doing is my best to inform individuals and you could do what you will with this knowledge. But I would rather sit down with inquisitive, curious people, respectful people, you know, who are willing once again to listen and learn. I would rather spend all of my energy doing what I can to inform them than trying to convert somebody who's too hard headed to actually open up a book and, and see you know where these misdeeds are taking place and how they're still impacting our communities so many things um but i'm going to cede the floor here uh to our audience who has lots of good questions i'm excited about this um i'm going to start with the first one that came in it is from lashawn hannon hello 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 um who says it sounds like you're both talking about two types of cultural competency uh one requiring teachers to be culturally competent about the families and communities in which they work um, and then two, helping students to be culturally competent about their histories and teaching them how to advocate for themselves. Um, and so LaShawn is asking, how do we do that, both of those things, when there are also many teachers of color who perpetuate colonized carceral logics? I love, I love LaShawn. <laughs> so... Great point. Got me sweating here. Like. Yeah. No, it is a great point. So I wear a hoodie. That I love hoodies. Sorry, as you can see. But there's this one hoodie I got that I really, really like. And it's Black History is 365. Mm -hmm. Right? When we normalize that in, a, in, in our classroom settings, right? It is in February. It is in such and such Heritage Month, right? But it's a daily instructional pattern, right? Where it's a reciprocal component, right? Um, where student and teacher are engaged in a dance of now I am the teacher. Right? Imagine if we asked our children to come into the classroom before we started to tell them how it is they need to define themselves, right? But we actually started asking them, how do you see yourself right now? Who are you? Where did you come from? What's your grandmother's name? What's your grandfather's name? What's your great great grandfather's name? Let me hear your lineage. My faith, again, I'm, I love Islam, it's, it's my traditions, but there's this really fascinating thing about the Arab culture, even that predates Islam. The word Ibn. If you ever come across an Arab person's name, they might have like 12 Ibns in their name. <laughs> Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Ibn Mustafa Ibn so on and so forth and you know why because that's connected to their lineage some people are capable in that region to trace their lineage back a thousand years through poetic verse they are capable in that space to instruct somebody instantly on who they are that's that reciprocal component that can happen. So if we started asking our children in the classroom setting today, tell me who you are. Not only does it develop their public speaking skills, like literally getting them out of their shell and saying, I want you to speak about 
something you have expertise on and that's who you are. And then when they conclude, you say, this is who I am. Not the teacher part, who you actually are. I think that 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 is right. That's the cultural competency component that complement complement the two. I love that. Um, do you want to add, Chris, or can we jump to the next question? They came. They they didn't come to play today. Uh, okay, yeah, I see. I see. Um, <laughs> I say like there is like a lot of information like that's being put out there. You know, um, you have. Um, like um, a lot of forums where, you know, phenomenal scholars um, from Vanderbilt University and their um, race and justice um, section, you know, where they, and they're also, they, they also have um, a, a urban, a urban educational journal and where they like highlight a lot of the talker points in their workshops, you know, about carceral logic, carceral approaches in um in urban classrooms and um and even how a lot of us end up perpetuating a lot of the tendencies that you know we were um exposed to from our oppressors. And I and I find like sitting down, you know, like and really, you know, with experts and going through the research and learning more about these things, it does a lot. It shifts perspectives. Um, if we're at a workshop, of course, that individual who's less knowledgeable gets to sit down, interact with individuals, ask questions. And it's also a way of calling folks out without having to call them out, you know? Be like, yeah, you know, like <laughs> as soon as they start saying something, you may I'll go look at your colleague, like, damn, that sound familiar. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you should definitely take some notes over here. You know, so like I think that these spaces is where um like it allows a lot of us to start critiquing our teaching approaches, to start critiquing. Even the structure of our classrooms, you know, um, and, and and I think that's where we need to place a lot of the a lot of our skin folk that may be parroting too much Kanye and Candace Owens and not actually like sitting down and reading <laughs> enough enough for enough for the Malcolms and you know like in the Ida B Wells of our time you know so like I say like that's one of my you know like best approaches I will kind of refer somebody to something like hey I'm going to this conference I'm going to this workshop you know you should join me you know it's phenomenal this is the scholar that's delivering it and hopefully we could kind of pull them across the line through there. But also, like I don't, I don't really have too much energy for people who ain't trying. Once again, if you're not trying to wise enough, learn, become a better human being, then I'm not, I'm not here for that. You know, maybe you need to, I don't know, speak to your pastor or something. Like that's not, it's not <laughs> <good>. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I should not be on here cackling. That was classic. Um, I'm not even going to touch that one. I'm not. Even, I'm going to leave it alone. Uh, John Gasper asks uh, two things. One, how do you know your child is being taught the right things at school? Um, and then two, how do you handle a professor who doesn't give students a chance to ask questions about the material and instead spends more time talking than listening? Um, and so therefore doesn't know if their students um, understand the materials. Pull your child out that classroom. Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel like, um, you know, I think a community approach is a great way. If your child feels like this, and I'm pretty sure that there's other children in this classroom that feels like this, um, and sitting down and aligning yourself with like these um, different parents and, and just kind of approaching the instructor and stating that, you know, hey, um, a lot of these kids don't feel heard in your classroom. What are you going to do to change that? Because part of your role as an instructor is to ensure that our youth have their voices heard. And if you're not giving them an opportunity to critically think, to critique, and have their voices heard, then you're basically preparing my child to be a fry cook. And I can't have that. 
You know, like I want my child to to to, to be in charge of their own professional pathway, not limited because of the skills that they weren't able to lack. I mean, like because of the skills that they weren't able to craft because you didn't allow them to critically think, critique and ask questions in your classroom. And I think that's probably, you know, like um, it's, the teacher may not be the best fan of you at this conversation. But um, but yeah, like I think that if you do come over there in the community effort, you're united with other parents um because their um, you know, children probably felt the same way, that that teacher will be more likely to be like to actually like have a listening ear. And if they don't, then then we have to start taking it to the heads of these schools. You know, we have to start sitting down with principals and superintendents and stating that, hey, you know, this education that's been de- that's being dished out in this classroom is lackluster and i'm holding you accountable i'm putting your foot to the fire for a change that's good yeah you want to tackle the um, second one yeah the, the to the second point back when i was a student one of the best pieces of advice i received from another student um was that your professor's office hours right those are the moments when you get to pick their brain, right? And it's a really great opportunity as a student to network. Uh, It's one of the things I do as my role as a program coordinator and counselor is that I advise my students to do not bombard your professors with emails because you feel the pressure of deadlines. That's going to happen. But the professors are under deadlines as well. And when it comes to lectures, an hour and 20 minutes, have to deliver a significant amount of content, depending on how many students they have. They may not be able to get to everything that they envisioned themselves getting to. Them office hours are everything. You might be able to go up in there and have a conversation with your professor, and that professor might say, you got it. You really are grasping the material. And now, come midterms, come finals, and you're like, ah, the professor's already aware of you. They know who you are. You're engaging with the material. And the professor is appreciative of that, as opposed to an email with a subject line that says, help, panic, I, I'm struggling. And it's the first time they ever heard from me. That's a fair point, y'all. There's a lot of professors waiting on Zoom alone for an hour uh, or in their offices <laughs> waiting on y'all to come in uh, or waiting on students to come in for an hour or 90 minutes. Uh, nobody shows up. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of board professors out there. I want to just let you know everybody know. <laughs> there's a lot of board professors out there, you know, so like ask good questions, bring in a new research. Um, like me, I used to finish my papers early and then, you know, send it to the professor. Like, yeah, would you look over this for me and tell me what you think? Like, and so, yeah, like definitely, I, I I agree. I agree with Talib, like utilizing those office hours and building that connection is, is it, it will go a long way. It will turn that, you know, B minus into an A, you know, definitely. Definitely. Um, this one is a really good question. I have my own thoughts about this, but I am not the center of the show, so I won't answer. But this question uh, is, is a child asking to use the bathroom? Sorry, this comes from Destiny McCombs, who asks, is a child asking to use the bathroom something you think should be abolished from schools? I uh, Simply put, yes. <laughs> right. Because it goes back to the surveilling and regulating of the human body. You're questioning the, the, the veracity of a child saying they have to use the bathroom. Why not just have the pass available by the door? Said student feels the urgent need to do what it is that humans do. And they do not have to seek permission for that. Because the worst thing that could happen, they end up developing a psychological component and connection to a natural process and end up being traumatized by that to where later on in life they can end up with a plethora of issues. Um, so, yeah, no, nah, it should absolutely be abolished. Trust the children. You'd be surprised how amazing children are when you will trust them to just be who they are. I second that. <laughs> 
I'll give it a third. Um, okay, Lauren Wells says, uh, what do you say to teachers and school leaders who are operating or behaving based on systemic policies and procedures about how they can or should be disruptive? Gosh, that's, a, that's tough. <laughs> that's tough. But I think um, when it comes to a lot of our ways of pushing back against an oppressive system. You know, like we've been kind of writing about this for a for years. You know, like everybody from um Jonathan um Kozo, you know, to um yeah, I'm yeah, I'm with with his book Savage Inequalities, um to um um, we want to do more than survive. Um, like we we see like a lot of like books where um you have just these advocates that have been that that has been giving us the secret sauce on how they've been moving forward to basically attack like these different systems. And none of it is the same. You know, none none of it none of it has ever been the same. It changes based on the community. It changes based on power structures. If you even look at our history, like um, let's say if you're studying the Black Panthers, you know, you'll see two different sects on the West Coast where it was more community action orientated, and then on the East Coast where it was more bound to legislative um, legislative change. And so, I think kind of figuring that out. Um, one of the things we do is we have um reading groups and through our reading groups you know we're like hey you know this is nothing crazy you know like nothing like seven or eight hundred pages long you know but um you know just something that's very informative um i think we were reading um what was it like i think trauma informed practices by m daniels you know a phenomenal book and we sat down and we went through aspects of like how to decolonize classrooms by adopting cultural norms. You know, how everybody have a different style of learning. You could learn through, there's people who learn through rhyme. There's people who learn through storytelling. Like, but like, just because that doesn't reflect the dominant culture of learning, it doesn't mean that it's inadequate. It doesn't mean that it's inadequate, but like understanding how, this individual, how M. Daniels was able to make a more collaborative, like peer learning environment in her classroom. We adopted those practices. And I um, mean, I utilize it in my classrooms in prison. And so, um, and I say all of this to say, you know, like there's just like a lot of scholars out there, a lot of advocates out there, you know, who have been implementing different strategies to just try to shift this dynamic to create more um, inclusive classrooms and to um, just kind of decolonize their own framework when it comes to teaching. And I think sitting down with um, a group of scholars and kind of discussing these things, going back and forth um, through like either reading or um, like like reading books or sharing scholarly articles or just having a back and forth and figuring out how to um, overcome some of these issues that you see is glaring and present, you know, is a great approach, is a great starting point. And I think after those conversations, you know, like that's when we could start strategizing to truly implement the change that you want to see. I think that's amazing. Uh, I'll close on that one. In addition to all the other things y'all said, um, you're having your own literacy circles, folks, um, definitely is the basis for change making. Um, we have a set of questions from Shamira Bridal Charrier. Hopefully I said the full name correctly. Um, Shamira says, you guys are amazing. I am enjoying this conversation and your thoughts. Um, I have a few questions. One, what do you think are the reasons for the increase in suspensions, expulsions, and school-based arrests in schools across the country? Um, two, uh, how do we overcome the school-to-prison pipeline? And three, if you had a million dollars to spend on education in your community, what would you do with it? That's solid. I like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll go after the first one because this is... <laughs> <laughs> Are you taking number two? Yeah, I'm back like, and I'll, say, and I'll set it off. I live for number two. Okay. But um, number one, I okay. think, like, 
it was it was several things. Um, the Gun Free School Zone Act. You know, like um, that that gun free school zone act actually allowed individuals to interpret what type of behavior is um, suspension worthy. Basically, initially it was like, hey, you know, like if somebody brings a gun to school, then they got to be suspended for a year. And then it went from bringing a gun to school to even making a handshake with a gun or maybe drawing a weapon on your folder or on a board. And then it came to like, you know, even speaking loudly when it, when your teacher is asking you a question. So we've seen the interpretation of this policy becomes like just this force. That allowed that allowed instructors the the um, the the autonomy they wanted to basically suspend the student. They don't have to sit down with the principal and ask or or anybody. They don't need clearance for anyone. They could just do what they want to. Another major issue we've seen is the outsourcing of discipline to security guards and police officers on schools. Right, right now we have like in, like damn near in every school we have school resource officers. Some of them are actually actual police some of them are retired police or retired military and these individuals just presence in the school just having a school resource officer in your school it increases the rates of suspensions and um, by 30 percent and the rates of arrest by 20 percent because you literally have an officer in your school this is like a visual representation of the school to prison pipeline and this has become something that we just see like adopted throughout all of the schools in the United States um, since like the 1990s or at least low income schools. You don't really see that, you know, like in in like um, schools and more affluent communities. And also, like I would say, like um, aspects of surveillance, you know, like that I'm um, Liv spoke about earlier. So like everything from metal detectors to K-9 units to cameras, you know, to like all of these things that's occurring, you know, it's like you even have, you even have, um, you even have like in some schools where, where they will create this, how should I say, like, it's like we if we call them CIs, like confidential informants. They will know task students to be confidential informants and like go through the school and find dirt on other students, you know, so um so they could suspend these students or do whatever, you know, like um whatever type of discipline that they want to enact on these students, they'll be able to enact on them. And like, and all of this came by, like, it, it came as a result of the Guns Free School Zone Act in the 1990s to us going um, um, above and beyond by and bringing all of these officers in our school ha um, hallways, which increases um, 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 some arrest and suspensions in schools, you know, to just like the carceral aspects of surveillance in these schools as well. But I think like, yeah, definitely like the presence of these school resource officers is probably one of the most problematic factors in the school. And yeah, I'll pass it to Talib for number two. Well, I tell you, I love this brother. I genuinely love this brother. Ever since I met him, he's always increased me. And, and I'm grateful to have the brother share this world with us. Um, question two, what was it again, if you could repeat? <laughs> no problem. How do we overcome the school to prison pipeline? This is it's hard work, and I'm going to say why it's hard work, because it's on the parents to some extent, right? Yes, we come home tired after a long day of work, but our children just return from a place that may be miseducating him or her. And we have to ask those questions. What did you learn today? How are you feeling today? Um, it really comes down to those very simple questions, but then reviewing those concepts and maybe recentering, right? Because it's possible and most likely that they were going to be miseducated somewhere because there was a human being that happened. There. They're not infallible. We can't also think for a second that our teachers are infallible. They're coming into those spaces sometimes, as we learned in that very early clip of the preschools, it was black and white teachers that looked at black boys as more problematic. We got a lot of implicit stuff with us. Man. So 
we as parents though it's our obligation to really start engaging with our children very early with regards to getting beyond the generality of how was your day and accepting oh it was good as enough got to be more probing right and also looking through i mean they got the apps now i got it on my phone i'm reviewing the lessons as they're coming in what what's going on with this dip and I don't contribute the dip to ability. I attribute the dip to he may not be relating to this stuff because it just ain't him. It's not his thing. Right? We have to be active um, educators in our children's lives. Because if we think for a second that the public school system was designed to make your child uh, more accessible to a higher education, that's not it. That's not, there's a reason why there's public school, charter schools, private schools, and schools that we probably don't even know exist because it's so damn elite <laughs> and exclusive and privileged, right? Our role as parents is to disrupt that. All right, number three, we need we need all the all the good stuff here. This is the mic drop moment. If you had a million dollars to spend on education in your community, what would you do with it? Assessments and STEM. Mm. So two things, and I stated this at a talk I had, um, you know, last week. Um, assessments is needed um, because we have to understand what type of learners our students are. Without understanding what type of learners our students are, how do we expect them to connect in a class? To, we expect them to connect with their teachers in a classroom or connect to the lesson plans in a classroom. So like having assessments on that type of learning, collecting that information, that should be, I don't know, like the first damn near month of school. That's 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 what we should be focusing on. Like specifically, what type of learners are are these students what like and when do they engage what are they the most comfortable with what's the most challenging thing for them how can we make this challenging thing something effortless like this is the type of discussions that we should be having and we could have it if we collect this type of information and get a better understanding of the type of learners that we're working with and the second thing um when i said stem STEM is just an integral part of education. I don't know why they separated it. You know, they're like, hey, we're going to create our own, um, you know, um, thing where we focus on science, technology, engineering, math, math. We just had science, you know, when, when, when I went to school, it was science. And like, and we got all of those aspects, you know, through science. But um, it, what we see now is you could literally tell the quality of a school your child goes to depending on what type of math and science classes that they offer. Why? Because when it comes to like math and science classes, you're spending more money on instructors. And those instructors can't have a high turnaround. Rate. They got to be there for the long haul. You're spending money on labs. You're spending money on beakers. You're spending money on equipment. And so like, when you're able to do that and provide those type of resources, then you know that that school isn't playing with their education. They're putting money into the type of equipment that is needed to ensure that your child gets a stellar education. And another major reason that we have to invest in STEM, to be successful in a in a um, college, I mean, for your undergraduate degree, and this is, you know, like this is out there. I think the un and the the NAACP did this. Um, yeah, they put the study out there. I would say in 2019. Um, they, I'm 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 gonna share the link with y'all. <laughs> you know, like I, it, it's somewhere by reading this, and it and it stated that in order for your child to be successful in college, they need at least. Um, three um, science classes and math classes that brings them up to at least the pre-calculus level. They found that students who didn't go into college, you know, like with that type of experience to uh, math and science were 40 percent more likely to fail out. And so 
that shows you if your school's like highest math is like an algebra, if it's not going to pre-calc, if your school doesn't even have like AP classes, when it comes to like chemistry, like, like you're literally, you're literally putting that child at a disadvantage. This becomes a human rights issue, a social issue, a major issue. Because we know that if this child is not able to get through college, then they'll have to settle for a low income work. Settling for low income work create times of desperation. Times of desperation is a ticket to incarceration. So yeah, we need those classes in our schools. Math literacy classes, computer literacy classes, pre-calc, science classes. Like we need these things to properly prepare our students to navigate to higher education and to also have the competency to navigate the world around them. So yeah, that's that's what I'll do with my million. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, what would you do with yours? I'd be supporting my brother right there. Because <laughs> there's no more, there's no follow up to that. He just eloquently touched on exactly why it is we need to fund our schools in STEM. He actually did a presentation not too long ago that regards to that also being one of those pipelines, right? Um, not having access to STEM. Um, I don't know if he, he may have that recorded somewhere, but I remember him bringing me up to speed on that and it just hit home. It's like when I was a kid, not only was math, it became a boogeyman because it, the educators there didn't even know how to give it to me. And majority of the kids I remember growing up in the public school system I grew up in uh, for the time that I was there anyway, it, it was social um, promotion, 101. And for those who don't know, social promotion is I'm 12 years old. I need to be with 12 year olds. So just move him on to the sixth, seventh grade, so on and so forth. I I'm dead serious about this. I told you what happened to me as a child, so all the way up to adulthood. But what led to that was the social promotion. I was promotion in danger with straight F's from the fourth grade all the way up to eighth grade before I got expelled from school. And then a transition beyond to a carceral setting. If, if we're going to take that million dollars, the brother said, assess that. Somewhere along the lines, this social promotion stuff, if it's still happening now, get it, get rid of it. That should not be happening in 2023. All right, good folks. Uh, we know y'all want to eat dinner if you're not already eating dinner um, or you may have shows to watch. Um, so we won't interrupt uh, that time, but we appreciate y'all and we will give applause to our two brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scholars. Thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom. Um, if you want to know what you want us to talk about next, so follow us, please, on social media uh, and put messages, uh, share comments on our um, posters, flyers, those social media posts, and let us know what you'd like us to explore next. If you want us to bring uh, these gentlemen back uh, and have them talk about other aspects of the work that they do, um, if you want to hear things about parents' rights or parents' advocacy, um, we've been tossing around a lot of things, but we want to know what you want. Um, so we thank you once again. We appreciate everyone who has showed up and supported and continues to support. And if you want more, uh, come to our in-person workshops. They are completely free, um, just like this one. And you are going to walk away um, with rich community experience. So uh, we're looking out to, to have you all come to the next one. All right. Have a good night. Good folks. <laughs>